Good morning and welcome to another country that doesn't exist. Like Transnistria, Artsakh, the capital, Stepyan and Kirk. You might not have heard of it. You might have heard of it by its other name, Nagorno-Karabakh though. And Nagorno-Karabakh is one of those countries where we remembered the war and the conflict at the end of the years of the Soviet Union. And here behind me is the monument they nickname it Grandma and Grandpa. Its real name is We Are Our Mountains because they're very proud of their mountains, the people here in the Gorno Karabakh. I want you to look at this one. Very typical Armenian looking man with his beard and Grandma with the gag over her mouth. And why does she have a gag? Because the traditional dress here in the Gorno Karabakh had women with a gag over their mouth such to the extent that if they wanted to speak to their husbands they had to pass the message through their children. Anyway, let's have a look around Nagorno-Karabakh. Here in Artsakh, which is the other name for Nagorno-Karabakh, this is the Gan Sasar Monastery Complex, uh, which is one of the most respected in the area. It was built in the 13th, uh, 13th century and is one of the few that was completely spared by the Mongols and it's just beautiful and peaceful and a great example of the architecture here and magnificently well preserved and an incredible amount of detail and the scenery from here is spectacular. While some of the uh, old architecture is pretty good I'm not sure what I think about this new stuff. I'm looking out through a small hole from a command bunker across a battlefield and it reminds me that while we can think of the collapse of the Soviet Union as a good thing, it did lead to some tragedy. And here is the front line, literally, of one of those tragedies because I'm standing in a pillbox command center having walked down some trenches on the front line between what was the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, for the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh, which went for about three or four years in the early 1990s. Tens of thousands were killed, many were made homeless. And this front line runs through an abandoned, vacant old village where Azeris fled to the other side of the border and Armenians fled to this side of the border. And this field of broken dreams, this heartbreak ridge, can remind us some people paid a very, very heavy cost indeed. You know, when you walk through ruined, destroyed houses and you think of the children that laughed and cried and played and the families that were happy and sad and the things that went on in places like this, and then the war happened and the bombs fell and the bullets flew and the screams grew louder and people fled for their lives not knowing what to do and you can't help but reflect and think <laughs> why does humanity do this to itself the war in nagorno karabakh in the early 1990s isn't just because of the fall of the soviet union it can trace its way back through millennia in the first century BC, the Kingdom of Armenia first incorporated Nagorno-Karabakh, the Black, the Black Gardens, the, or the, the mountainous Black Gardens, which is literally what Nagorno-Karabakh means. And they lived more or less happily side by side, and then as wars ebbed and flowed across the century, as the Persians took on the Turks, as the Turks took on the Christians, as wars went backwards and forwards across the epoch of history, this, like Bosnia, was one of the many battlefields that people ebbed and flowed. In the 1980s, Nagorno-Karabakh had an independent status, independent oblast within the Azerbaijani Socialist Soviet Republic. And they had a vote, which was not approved or endorsed, and they wanted to join with Armenia. Moscow disagreed. So when Armenia 
and Azerbaijan both declared their independence, Nagorno-Karabakh decided it wanted to join with Armenia, the Azeris said no way, and then we had the war starting. I'd like to say that those trenches were the only signs of conflict and war around here, but I stand now in the battlement, the watchtower of Tagranakert Castle. This is the uh, slightly reconstructed ruin of an 11th century castle. And you can tell by looking out the battlements over the battlefields of the 1990s that they're also looking over the battlefields of the 1100s. And up on the hill is a fortified chapel from the 700s. Spectacular from down there, even more spe spectacular from up here. Seventh century fortified church and wait till you see the view from here. Looking backwards towards Nagoro Karabakh is just spectacular mountains and hills. But the military man in me looks this way. And you see Azerbaijan and you see this plane coming up, butting up against the hills and you can understand why this became the front line of battle. It reminds me a little bit of Gettysburg. I stood above the battlefields looking down upon where I thought the front lines would come and who had the high ground and who didn't. And as you drive down, well, we'll see it when we drive down, but as we were driving up from down below, you could see the trenches still paralleling down the slope. And you can imagine the Azeri forces coming up. The fear that would have existed inside the Armenian forces but they would have seen those hills and the Armenians had the high ground and you looked down upon them and you wouldn't want to attack up through here. So this spectacular view, you can understand why it was up here in the seventh century to fortify themselves. But when you look over the plain and think back 25 years ago, what it would have been like. Wow. The most recent conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenian Nagorno-Karabakh forces was just in April in Easter. And since then you can see new fortifications being built here just in case. Look, we are in the middle of a ruined city that was founded in the first century BC by Tigran the Great, the great grandfather of Tigranakert III who brought Christianity to Armenia. In the middle of this town is a basilica that ran from the fourth century AD to the 10th century before it finally collapsed and this whole town was overgrown. It tells us a lot. Firstly, people lived here 2,000 years ago and thought it was the center of the world and thought it would live forever. And guess what? They were wrong. And you think through a lot of cities in Central Asia that were grand and great for a thousand years between the year 500 and 1500. And all through that time, they would have thought their cities would last forever and they didn't. And we sit in our cities today, London and York and Melbourne, and we think they will last forever. But we're vulnerable too. And the greatest vulnerability that exists to our modern cities and our way of life is conflict. And we have to find a way of avoiding it when we can. Not appeasement, but a sensible way of avoiding unnecessary conflict. But this is just down the road from those trenches that 25 years ago saw the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan for the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh. Does that provide any lesson for us? Because not only was this a battlefield 25 years ago and an ancient city 2,000 years ago, but there is also an old fortified castle from the 1100s, which has been rebuilt. There is also a fortified chapel from the 700s. The truth is this territory of land has been fought over for millennia because everyone has invaded here. The Persians invaded here, the Turks invaded here, the Mongols invaded here. And then when someone else wasn't invading and the Soviet Union collapsed, people who lived here turned on themselves anyway. Peace is such a hard thing to sustain. And if we put it in today's context where so many of the commentators are talking about our war between Islam and the secular West. Well, if there's going to be a war between Islam and the secular West, this is going to be the front line. Why? Because that is Azerbaijan, Islamic. That is Armenia, Christian. And these battlefields 
where there are bones sticking out of this dirt should tell us something. If we can't find a way to avoid a war, we'll inevitably have another one. And while my view is the us versus them concentric circle should be us all moderates against them all radicals of whatever religion, there are people in our society that say it should be us Western Christians against them Islam. There are those in our society who say we should end multicultural pluralism. And there are those in the Islamic society that say we the West are the great Satan. If we let those radicals push us moderates into a corner, there'll be another war and it will be a war to end all wars where this will be just one battlefield again between two great cultures where only one culture will come out the winner and both will come out the loser. That is what walking down these old battlefields hammers home to me.